town hall for the community of Oakland and beyond. Every Thursday night from six to eight, you can join us to get your questions answered and also hear from fascinating experts in things that matter to you. Tonight will be no different. Uh, we are featuring around 615, one of the most inspirational leaders in public health that I uh, know of and, and a huge influence uh, in my thinking, Dr. Tony Eiten, the Senior Vice President of the California Endowment, the person who brought us the recognition that your zip code matters as much to your health outcomes as your genetic code. Dr. Eiten will talk about public health and particularly highlight why the health disparities that are being highlighted in COVID-19 matter so much, not just now, but always. After Dr. Eiten, we're gonna hear from our own Warren Logan, Policy Director of Mobility and Interagency Relations for the Office of the Mayor. Warren's gonna talk about something that has gotten national recognition for Oakland, and that is our Slow Streets Initiative. Thank you, Warren. And then finally, our last special guest is Curtis Sawicki, Chief of Staff to the Oakland Unified School District. I know as an OUSD parent myself, many of us have questions for the school district about how food is being distributed to families, how students are engaging in distance learning, and what the future holds, particularly for Oakland's youth and parents. Around seven o'clock or so, uh, depending how long our fascinating speakers go, we will open it up to your questions. And if you could give me the slide about, about my first slide, please. In order to join the question, the, join the conversation, we want you, uh, if you, if you, you're certainly welcome to put it on social media but we really ask that you consider clicking on the link that you see in social media, scanning the QR code that you're seeing now, or texting 702-842-973 to the phone number uh, 72855. So that is how you can text questions and topics. Uh, next slide, please. This is called Thought Exchange. And by scanning that QR code, clicking on the link, or again, texting 702-842-973 to the number 72855, you can share your own thoughts. You can pose questions that you care about. You can also star and the thoughts or questions of others so we know which are of the most general interest to the full audience. And you can also see which ones rise to the top. So we ask everyone to start uh, thinking about what your questions are so you can submit them to Thought Exchange. And now I'm gonna start my weekly update on COVID-19 in Oakland. Next slide. There is hopeful news this week. Uh, this is the week that some predict we may in fact be reaching the peak of COVID-19 infections and impact on our healthcare system. The great news is that social distancing and staying at home has clearly saved lives. The Bay Area is receiving international recognition for being the very first to act with these measures and the results are very promising. We also heard the governor talk about the peak is not the end of this crisis, that the process of reopening our economy and coming back to our former way of life will be slow, it will not be a constant one, and that it is really reliant on testing, contact tracing, and the development of uh, vaccines, uh, treatment, and especially antibody testing. Next slide. Um, big updates this week on testing availability in Oakland. We are now opening up our testing sites to anyone 
anyone in Alameda County, not just Oakland, but anyone who is working or volunteering outside the home and is experiencing symptoms such as a fever, cough, or shortness of breath, or who has been exposed to someone who has COVID-19. Now, priority appointments will be given to healthcare workers and those that are at the highest risk. You have to have a referral and confirmed appointment to be tested. So please learn more and register for testing at oaklandca.gov slash testing. Again, that's oaklandca.gov slash testing. Again, we are so grateful to our partners at Brown and Toland Physicians. Again, these tests are free to people in Alameda County and, and, and also it is irregardless of your immigration status or your insurance status. This is open and free to everyone that meets those uh, health guidelines of being symptomatic or having been exposed to someone who is symptomatic and who is actually working outside the home. I also want to announce an exciting partnership with the Roots Community Health Center. We have launched along with them a comprehensive outreach and testing program to ensure that our most vulnerable residents, including those who have been recently released from incarceration and we have welcomed back into our community, have access to our testing sites. Roots is an amazing organization right here in Oakland whose mission is to uplift those impacted by systemic inequalities through wraparound medical and behavioral health care. So we are so thrilled to be partnering with Roots Community Clinic. I also wanna give an update on what we are doing to take care of our most vulnerable uh, homeless or unhoused or unsheltered neighbors. Uh, many people are aware that two hotels in East Oakland have been secured and we want to appreciate Alameda County for starting to accelerate the rate at which they are moving our most vulnerable unsheltered residents and those are people over the age of 65 or with medical condition into the two hotels that they have secured. They have now moved just over 200 individuals into those hotels. Additionally, the city of Oakland is readying a 66 trailer site that should be ready for move-in the first week of May. I know many people are concerned about COVID running rampant in shelters. Uh, we know that San Francisco has been really grappling with this challenge. I am very pleased to share that as of now and with the understanding that testing is inadequate, and so this is just based on the information that we have, but as of now, there have been no positive tests within the shelter community in the city of Oakland. Uh, in fact, just last night, we received results for 53 individuals that are being moved from St. Vincent de Paul's shelter, as well as the Crossroads shelter in East Oakland into the Radisson Hotel. And all 53 of those tests came back negative. We are continuing to test. We are continuing to ensure that all of our uh, sheltered homeless neighbors are in safe and healthy conditions. And we are working as quickly as we can to get everyone who is vulnerable off of the streets and into safer shelter. Um, see. Next slide. Um, we're, you're going to hear a lot more about it from Warren Logan, but uh, this last weekend we rolled out the first little more than four miles of our Slow Streets Initiative. A total of 74 miles throughout the city of Oakland that have been identified as candidates to be closed to through traffic so that Oaklanders can spread out and socially distance as they move through the city, particularly as they bike, run, and walk. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, we want to clarify what, what the slow streets do and do not do. Uh, they do declare that roads are closed to through traffic. 
uh, and that is indicated through signage and partial barricades at key locations. And it is to, it, to promote physical distant activity, social distancing, that is the goal. What it does not do, it, it does not encourage social gatherings or events on this street. This is not your street party, people. This is just a spread out as you move around. It does not in any way limit access for emergency vehicles or close streets to people that have to access that street as their final destination. And that includes food delivery, package delivery, people that are visiting you. The streets are open to anyone whose destination is on that street, but they must drive extremely carefully. And we at this time are not seeking to ticket or financially penalize those who use the corridors as through streets. We are hoping that this is something that we as a community can enforce together. It also does not impact AC transit bus lines. Next street, next slide. Uh, this is some information about how to get your stimulus check. If you were fortunate enough to qualify and receive uh, a tax refund in 2018 or 19 using direct deposit, your stimulus check should come automatically into your bank account. Uh, if you didn't, uh, you can fill out the get my payment application at the IRS uh, website. It's irs.gov slash coronavirus slash get my payment with, with slashes in between those last three words. If you did not file taxes, use the non-filers, enter your payment here application, and do make sure that your address is up to date. Uh, the IRS will mail you a letter approximately 15 days after it sends your payment. So go to irs.gov for more information. I know people are anxious to get those stimulus checks. Next slide. A lot of people in Oakland who are receiving stimulus checks or who are not are making a pledge to share some of that stimulus or, or their good fortune with our immigrant families that are not receiving federal aid of any type. And so we encourage you to check out stimuluspledge.org as a way for Oaklanders to share with our very most vulnerable families, our undocumented and immigrant families that have been left out of federal assistance. Uh, again, we want to commend Governor Gavin Newsom for yesterday announcing a $125 million fund specifically to help our undocumented families in California. Roughly 2 million Californians are not going to be eligible for federal aid due to our immigration system, uh, which I believe is a broken one. So I encourage everyone to thank the governor for his leadership and support also organizations like our own Centro Legal de la Raza, which also has an undocumented workers support fund. Next slide. Again, uh, we one of the contributions to that undocumented worker fund was made through Oakland's own COVID-19 relief fund. We uh, would welcome participation from all Oaklanders to contribute to help those who need it the most during this unprecedented health crisis. This fund has already helped prioritize testing for our frontline workers. It has helped support the undocumented worker fund, the service worker fund, as well as done emergency grants to our extremely low income small business owners. It has also helped Meals on Wheels double their capacity to reach our seniors who are homebound during this epidemic. And so please consider contributing at oaklandfund.org. Lots of good work being done with that fund. Uh, another opportunity to help out, uh, Curtis Sawicki will talk later about some of the challenges that the digital divide is causing for our students who are trying to learn from home.
If you have a computer, laptop, hotspot, any sort of technology that you think Oakland families could use right now, you can donate it to Tech Exchange, techexchange.org. Next slide. Just a reminder that our libraries are providing online story time and play, play and learn activities, online tutoring, and remember you can check out books online. Next slide. What a year for the Earth. Uh, this nationally is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, so it will feel strange to celebrate it indoors, but Oakland is ready because that's just who we are. Uh, please visit Earth, OaklandEarthDay.org and you will see 50 ideas to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day safely from inside your home. Next slide. Uh, we also remind folks that we welcome volunteers. We have safe, appropriate activities for volunteers. Please email Community Engagement 510 at gmail.com. One fun uh, volunteer project coming up will be the Great Oakland Check-In. The Great Oakland Check-In will mobilize many volunteers to make one-on-one -on -one phone calls starting to our most vulnerable seniors to check in on them and to see what their needs are right now during the shelter in place. Next slide. We also recognize that during the shelter in place, we are seeing an increase in anxiety, in depression, and also in domestic violence. No one should have to suffer alone. On this slide are many resources that are available to you during this pandemic. I particularly uh, encourage folks to, to seek out the Domestic Violence Crisis Hotline 1-800-947-8301 or visit the Alameda County Family Justice Center, ACFJC, as in Alameda County Family Justice Center dot org. Next slide. All right, I also got a lot of questions this week about our parks. Uh, Lake Merritt is still a very popular place to be, and I do not want to shut it down. I don't. So if you want to keep these beautiful parks open to enjoy, you have to practice social distancing. You must stay six feet away from others. If you are exercising, I highly encourage, it is recommended by our health official that you put a cloth over your mouth. A simple bandana will do. It is for the protection of others that you cover your face with a bandana or mask. And please avoid running in commercial districts where people are doing their essential shopping. Do not pick a running route that goes by a grocery store, please. This is part of our whole point of Oakland slow streets. We are trying to give you more outdoor space to spread out appropriately. And finally, we do want to hear from you. I am committed as your mayor to continue to offer these town halls every Thursday night from six to eight, but we want to make sure that they are meeting your needs, that you are getting the information that you want from these town halls. So please fill out our feedback survey at bit.ly slash Oak Town Hall feedback, or give our office a call we're always answering our phones, 510-238-3141, or email officeofthemayor at oaklandca.gov. That concludes my slide presentation. You could come back. Yeah, thank you. Um, now it is time for me to introduce our first guest. And I am very excited. I'm going to give you all a sneak peek uh, at each one of these town halls we try and provide a little bit of, of fresh news. Uh, we are very excited that tomorrow morning, I will be part of a joint announcement establishing a task force for COVID-19 racial disparities. When we look at the moment that we're in and we recognize the anxiety and the fear and the uncertainty of what we're experiencing, 
I hope we also ask ourselves, what are we learning in this moment? What are the injustices, the inequities that could have been avoided if we had created better systems in the first place so that fewer people were suffering right now? And one of the issues that has been lifted up by this crisis that Oaklanders have been aware of for a very long time is the shameful disparities in health outcomes by race. And here to talk about this issue in uh, a way that is so inspiring to me personally is someone who truly pioneered the idea that your zip code is more determinative of your health outcomes than your genetic code the former health officer of Alameda County who rose to international prominence for his groundbreaking work and now serves as the senior program director for the California Endowment. One of my heroes, Dr. Tony Eiten. Thank you, Thank you Mayor Schaff. And it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Hello, Oakland, how y'all doing? Um, you got some great leadership here. Um, we're very lucky to have Mayor Libby Schaff uh, during a crisis and not during a crisis uh, to really practice the kind of leadership that's taking Oakland into sort of the, the future that we're looking to achieve. Um, so I'm going to show you some slides or somebody's going to show you some slides. I, I don't know who has them. Um, and, you know, I hope that we can have somewhat of a dialogue here because this is a this is a not a simple issue uh, this is a very complex issue i like to make the distinction between complex and complicated uh, it's not complicated it's complex complex meaning that there are a lot of moving parts uh, but it's still relatively simple to understand it and it's relatively logical to follow um, uh, essentially the root to the root of these issues uh, let's go to the next slide please Okay, so we've seen a lot of press uh, recently about the disproportionate impact of coronavirus infections and deaths on the African American population in, in many parts of the country, um, particularly in New Orleans, uh, in Philadelphia, in New York City, in Detroit, in Milwaukee, in Georgia, um, and even in California. Uh, the state is now tracking uh, deaths and African Americans are about twice as likely to die as our representation uh, in the state thus far. Um, and that's been pretty consistent across the United States. We see about a, twice the representation amongst deaths of African Americans than our actual representation in the population. Uh, and in some places, it's even more like in Chicago. Um, and trying to understand that uh, is an important question. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, I want to take you back uh, over a hundred years ago to W.E.B. Du Bois, um, you know, who talked about this notion of I'm getting a little signal here on my screen. The most difficult social problem in the matter of the Negro, of Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation towards the well-being of the race. There have now been few other cases in, his, in the history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. I was in 1899 talking about um, health disparities in Philadelphia. Um, and, and what he's talking about is this notion that I refer to as policy violence. And policy violence, next slide please, is really kind of indifference to the fundamental needs of populations, even in the face of abject need. And this is, you know, the reason that the United States is unique amongst developed nations in not having universal health care, not having meaningful systems to support uh, child care, not having paid sick leave, on and on and on. And if you actually explore the root of the efforts to bring about universal policies in many of these domains, you find that the thing that derailed universality is racism. And, and oftentimes overt, um, very explicit racism on the part of, of senators, legislators, uh, typically from the South. Um, you can do the legislative research yourself, um, but it's, it's a clear theme that runs through our policymaking in this country 
and it has implications all the way from W.E.B. Du Bois to today. Next slide, please. What I'm showing you there, that policy violence is an op-ed that I wrote in the Sacramento Bee that ran yesterday. Okay, so if you wanna understand this issue, you have to understand the layers of inequity. And when I'm talking about African-Americans, I'm using African-Americans as an example because it's been oppressed and I'm an African-American male. Um, but I could just as easily be talking about other communities of color and other socially vulnerable populations. And we'll see, I guarantee you, as the data starts to be really processed and explored across COVID-19, we will see other populations disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. I mean, African-Americans are really kind of the, the tip of the spear in a sense. Um, and because of the unique history of anti-black racism in this country, um, we see these manifestations most clearly in African-Americans, but it will not be unique to African-Americans by any stretch of the imagination. And so to understand this, you have to understand that there are multiple layers to the structural inequity that drive these kinds of outcomes. And I'll point out that it's not just COVID-19. We saw this in Hurricane Katrina. We saw this in the foreclosure crisis. We saw this in the HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, we see it frequently in, in long-standing heat waves across different parts of the country. You see these socially vulnerable populations um, disproportionately impacted by, by adversity of those, whatever the particular threat is. And when I say socially vulnerable, it's not, they're not naturally socially vulnerable. We make them socially vulnerable by uh, essentially the policies that we pass or, as I say, oftentimes just the absence of policy in the face of abject need. So the layers of inequity we're talking about have to do with um, how are African-Americans more vulnerable to exposure to COVID-19 in the first place? Um, what kind of testing regimes do we have in place that are actually ascertaining the level of infection uh, amongst African-American populations? What kind of underlying health disparities do African-Americans have to contend with which make them more physiologically uh, at risk for severe coronavirus infections and death. And then again, finally, uh, disparities in access to healthcare. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a, a Detroit bus driver by the name of Jason Hargrove, um, who made a um, now a viral um, video describing how, how vulnerable he felt as a bus driver in Detroit um, being exposed to uh, passengers on his bus that were making no effort to cover their cough or to uh, protect him uh, from whatever infection uh, they may have acquired. Um, he died of coronavirus uh, recently. Uh, and he's an example of the many, many, many frontline workers, disproportionately African-American bus drivers and and, and folks that are working in home health care, retail, service industries, where they can't socially distance themselves because it's the nature of their work. And these populations, again, disproportionately African-American, are much more at risk of being exposed to coronavirus. Next slide, please. In addition to being at risk, Here's a study from Drexel University in Philadelphia looking at who's getting tested. And um, at this professor at Drexel um, looked at zip codes in, in, in the city of Philadelphia and found that people in higher income neighborhoods are being tested six times more than people in low and low neighborhoods, despite the fact that the infection and death rate in low income neighborhoods is higher. Um, so you see even disparities in deciding how tests will be allocated across the city. Next slide. And then finally, in, in, in Alameda County, we know that there are disparities uh, based on where you live. Uh, when it, as, as the mayor said, when it comes to your health in the United States of America, your zip code matters more than your genetic code. And we've documented this. This map has been on the front page of the newspapers. Um, we've replicated it in 30 cities across the United States. And what you find is that in certain neighborhoods, you are much more likely to die prematurely um, because of the cumulative, in other words, the lifelong effects of inequity that manifest themselves in your life, as well as the synergistic 
which is the simultaneous uh, influence of these adverse uh, effects on your life, you, at the end of your life, are much more likely to have lost years of life. This whole notion of weathering um, due to essentially social disadvantage or social vulnerability that is largely based on this on this basic framework of racism, of policies that are designed to steer resources away from people who are considered to be less valuable. Next slide. And so you saw on that last slide, uh, some of the neighborhoods where uh, life expectancy is shorter. Um, this is also from Alameda County Public Health Department showing that in Alameda County, the, uh, the relative proportion of people who are living in high poverty neighborhoods is highest for African-Americans. One in three African-Americans lives in a high poverty neighborhood in Alameda County where greater than 20% of the residents live below the federal poverty level, which is actually already a very low level for uh, the West Coast and California in general because of our housing costs. So in terms of exposure, to adversity in neighborhoods that are socially vulnerable, African-Americans have the highest level of exposure. Next slide. And finally, I'll finally from Alameda County Public Health Department. Um, this is all cause mortality rates, which is basically death. Um, you know, what is the rate of death for various different populations um, in Alameda County? And you see that African-Americans have the highest rates of all-cause mortality. Uh, there's nothing new about this information. It's actually gotten a little bit better over the past decade, which is great news. Um, but there's still huge disproportionality uh, for African-Americans and other socially vulnerable populations, Pacific Islanders, uh, Native Americans, uh, and others also have disproportionate uh, death rates in Alameda County. Okay, next slide. And so we know uh, that there are things that we can do to actually address this. We know it. We've known it for the, the longest while. And some of the things are related to what's happening right now in Oakland uh, in the COVID epidemic. We can actually do, as the mayor has been doing, trying to move testing closer to where the vulnerability is, trying to get the people who are most likely to get infected, most likely to get sick if they get infected, and most likely to get to die if they get sick. We know the neighborhoods uh, where we have the highest level of social vulnerability. So our goal is to essentially bring as much testing into those neighborhoods as possible so that people have as good information as they, as they need and that they can get the care that they need once they um, have been determined to be positive and their families can be isolated from them uh, in a way that prevents the disease from spreading. That's not rocket science. It's entirely doable. Uh, the mayor is doing it, uh, working with um, you know both Brown and Tolan and with the county to figure out how to deploy those resources in the smartest way possible, given what we know. Another thing we can do, which is actually quite creative, um, is to actually enlist the participation of the people most impacted in the problem to actually craft the solution. And, you know, one of the things that we need, we're going to need, particularly after we start loosening up uh, the economic shutdowns across the state, we're going to need very good epidemiology. What does that mean? The folks that go out and, and talk to the folks that have been exposed and do the contact tracing and track the various different um, cases that are out there and help those cases isolate and quarantine themselves. In some cases, if they don't have a place to isolate and quarantine themselves, helping them find safe places like the mayor is doing uh, for folks who may be homeless or folks who live in very crowded conditions who don't have access uh, to a good place to uh, isolate themselves from their loved ones. And so we're working with the state right now to actually create a whole new workforce uh, to stand up a workforce to be able to supplement public health departments to be able to do this contact tracing and um, you know case identification and to really be able to ramp up our public health approach in California. Um, there's very good training available uh, that both CDC and other universities, CCSF has that we can put people through six hours of training 
Uh, once they're trained, they can get a certification and then we can find uh, employment for them uh, either with the state or with health departments. We're trying to figure out that out right now um, and have them work in those communities that are most impacted. This is, this is shoe leather public health practice. This is, this, this is just the sort of the nuts and bolts of what we need to do to, to manage this going forward. Let's do it with the folks that are most impacted, find ways to pay them, the folks that have the most cultural sort of knowledge of the communities. Um, this could be a win-win if we do it right. We also have to enhance our culturally relevant messaging uh, to the African-American communities, um, as the mayor is doing um, with you know televisions, with advertisements, with social media, uh, through trusted influencers. Um, we have to do everything we can to get that message out about what's happening and make the, the information accurate and as real time as we can. Um, and I think that, you know, this notion of calling people, doing these check-ins across Oakland is absolutely wonderful. Um, that is a great idea that hopefully we can expand to the rest of the state as well. Longer term, we're going to have to address some policies. Uh, this is not a short-term problem. Um, we're going to have to look at truth and reconciliation, uh, as many cities across California have done, telling the truth about essentially what we've done intentionally to populations like African Americans, uh, Native Californians, Latinos, Chinese, Japanese, many others. Um, we have to start with our fresh slate. We have to tell the truth. We can't go forward the way that we have gotten here to date. Um, and then finally, we need a new social contract. Uh, in California. We need to get finally universal health care. We need to have universal paid leave. We need to have subsidized child care. We need to have meaningful living wage and benefits for all employed people. Um, there are a whole host of just fundamental social policies that we have ignored, uh, largely because we don't value the populations that would benefit most from that. And that makes us vulnerable. I want to say one other thing before I, I conclude, um, and that is that COVID-19 will not be the last pandemic. Um, we are going to see likely over the next couple decades, multiple zoonotic, zoonotic meaning uh, animal-based viruses uh, making the leap from animals to humans uh, that spread quickly across the globe because we lack immunity to them. Um, climate change is driving those interactions between humans and wild animals and wild, um, you know, ecologies. And as long as that continues to happen, we will see more pandemics and we will see more COVID-19 like crises. So we have to prepare ourselves from a policy perspective to make our entire country more resilient. Um, I listed here, uh, Policy Link has a, a, a great a blog which talks about some of the policy strategies. And I think the next slide is the last one or the second to last one. Next slide. No, next, ne next one. There we go. Okay, so no. That's, that's go back that's one, I think. <laughs> it's weird not to control this. Not that one, the one with unequal treatment there. Oh right over it. Anyhow, uh, this last slide is, is basically we've known for a long time that in the healthcare system, there's racism. Uh, black people are like less, much less likely to get appropriate cardiovascular medications, much less likely to get a coronary artery by, bypass grafting, much less likely to get dialysis, much less likely to get pain treatment. Um, there's racism all over the healthcare system. Um, uh, many of our systems out here in California have done a great job in trying to eradicate that. Um, but all of this plays a role in the disproportionate impact on death from coronavirus uh, from African Americans. So let me stop there and hopefully can join you later uh, in the question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Eiten. Um, this is the work and this is in some ways both um, startling and sobering, but also hopeful that we have some roadmaps to correct. Um, next, we're gonna move to a far more kind of light topic, I would say. Uh, 
uh, again, yeah, something that is hopeful that that most people have have received in a in a very positive light, and is really uh, an example of of meeting this moment with creativity and um, a sense of the possible. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, the director, uh, policy director for mobility, uh, Warren Logan. Uh, it is such an honor, Warren, to have you as part of the mayor's office. Hey everybody, um, thank you, Mayor, for the introduction. And I have some initial bad news that I will in fact be uh, bringing some statistics to this that lay bare, I think a lot of what Dr. Eiden was talking about in terms of racial disparities as well. But for all of that, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, hi everyone, I'm Warren Logan and I am the Mayor's Policy Director of Mobility and Interagency Relations. And I'm really excited tonight to talk to you about Oakland's Slow Streets Initiative. Um, Masai, you can go to the first slide. So last week, the city of Oakland launched the Oakland Streets Initiative, uh, implementing soft closures to restrict neighborhood streets to local vehicle traffic. Next slide. Tonight, I'm gonna share with everyone what the Oakland Street Slow Streets Initiative is about, what our first steps were last week to implement this initiative, and what to expect moving forward over the coming weeks. Before I do that though, I wanna address a question some of some of you have asked us and probably many others are thinking right now, which is why? Why this initiative, why now? Um, every Oaklander, first of all, should feel safe to walk, bike, drive, and take transit in their neighborhoods and throughout our city. And that is a paramount principle of the Department of Transportation and frankly of the entire city during and after this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, with that in mind, if we take a step back, and again, this is getting into our racial disparities work a little bit, um, and we look at the broader context of our work, it's really about safety and about equity. So I'm really happy to be following Dr. Wright on this because I'm just shoring up a major statistic that he broached on. Um, when we look at our data historically, we certainly have a lot to improve when it comes to traffic violence. Next slide, please. Uh, by the numbers, I'm gonna focus everyone on, on a key statistic here, by the numbers, if you are a black Oaklander, you are twice as likely to be killed in a crash and three times more likely to be killed or severely injured while walking in this city. So our job is to prioritize the safety and well-being for all residents across the city. And so when we move quickly and take big actions, not unlike the Slow Streets Initiative, we recognize that it impacts all of our residents and some more than others. And so I also wanna recognize that as we are all moving really quickly right now during this crisis, not all of our residents felt we engaged um, them as well as we could during the rollout of, of the Slow the Streets initiative. And we've made a lot of adjustments to communicate more frequently, excuse me, frequently with our residents on our proposed Slow Streets, uh, which you'll hear about more in a couple of minutes. So again, I just wanna stress that as we all develop our new strategies to respond to COVID-19 pandemic, the Slow Street Slow Initiative is grounded in our core beliefs around safety and equity. And this is a time when we need more space to socially distance, really physically distance, socially present in our neighborhoods. And we want to slow our streets to car traffic. We certainly do not want to increase the trips to the hospital from car traffic or collision. So we're hopeful this will encourage safer, slower driving fewer collisions while also providing low traffic speeds, or excuse me, low traffic streets for physically distant uh, essential trips while walking, uh, wheelchair rolling, jogging, and biking across the city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are some great uh, user submitted photos. Uh, the Oakland Slow Streets Initiative designates a network of streets to people walking, again, bicycling and running by declaring emergency road closures to through traffic in neighborhoods across Oakland. We identified these streets from the city's existing and proposed bike routes included in the bike plan, I'll talk about this in a second, which came out of an extensive community engagement process, were vetted and analyzed by city staff and unanimously adopted by our city council just last year. Uh, from this, we are removing certain streets such as streets with bus routes and streets that are adjacent to emergency services and gathering feedback um, from users like you, feedback about what other streets we should be considering for our Slow Streets program. 
Uh, on slow streets, residents can make essential outdoor trips using the roadway while reducing foot traffic at parks, especially our Lake Merritt, which the mayor had mentioned before, and our outdoor trails, which we have found are experiencing extremely high usage since the shelter in place order began. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So last week, we piloted soft closures on four and a half miles of our network using road close to through traffic signage, traffic cones and barriers on four street segments. And on this map, it's the purple streets. And I'm just gonna share with everyone right now, this map is available online. We also have a higher quality map. So calm down where you're gonna be able to see it zoomed in as much as you want very soon. Uh, this week, we asked for feedback on 11 more miles of street network. And based on your feedback, we've selected the following streets. And these are the orange ones that you see here on this map. That's Dover Street, that's in North Oakland, um, from Alcatraz to 52nd. Uh, in sort of West Oakland, we've got 32nd Street from Mandela Parkway to San Pablo Avenue. Uh, in uh, North Cleveland Heights in San Antonio, we've got 11th Avenue, Bayview Avenue, El Elliott Street, East 34th Street, from East 8th to Park Boulevard, which sounds like a lot. It's a very long street that takes a quick zigzag and continues up the hill. And then lastly, uh, we've got Brookdale Avenue from Fruitvale Avenue to Kingsland Avenue. Uh, we'll roll out soft closures, just like I spoke about before, on these streets tomorrow. So looking forward to that. Um, you'll also see in this map gray streets, see those gray streets, everybody, that we're evaluating now for later weeks. So for many folks listening and watching, this map is available again on our website shown at the bottom of the screen. And we also have a dynamic map so folks can zoom in and out. I'm gonna pause for a second so everyone can see that part. Um, okay, Messiah, next slide, please. So before I take some of the questions that you all submitted to our town hall, I wanna acknowledge some of the questions that I've received and that our team at the DOT and across the city have received about this initiative. Uh, so the first is that we received a lot of questions about why we chose these streets and, and sort of how we went about choosing them in the first place. So a little bit of history here. Last year, so just last year, our Department of Transportation received feedback from over 3,500 people about which streets they felt should be safer for people to walk and bicycle along. That plan specifically included a network of neighborhood bikeways. So by design, most of these streets are actually narrow and should carry less traffic than any wider street throughout the city. And so as the mayor pointed out before, we feel that these streets are sort of um, safer by design, but that, that they are uh, self-enforcing. Next slide, please. Uh, some of you have asked what no through traffic means. And so in short, I wanna clarify this. If you live on one of these streets, you are welcome to drive slowly, please, to get home or to your essential trips. Similarly, service and delivery vehicles and also our emergency vehicles have access to that block as well. This doesn't impact parking or waste collection. We hope we, everyone will share this space compassionately during this um, Oakland slow streets period and basically during all of the COVID-19 crisis. Next slide, please. Um, a, few of, a few of you have asked on social media uh, and via text message and phone calls, uh, where you can share your feedback. So we have a lot of answers for that. I'd like to thank really our amazing Oakland, uh, Oak 311 team for adding a channel to their system to collect feedback related to the Oakland slow streets and to answer questions. Um, for people, uh, they're also welcome to visit our Oakland slow streets website. You've got it right there and provide feedback on our slow streets initiative through our user survey. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about process and, and sort of what to expect over the coming weeks. Uh, next steps for this program are definitely going to be iterative. We are working now to determine what time frames work best for our community and for the capacity of our staff who are balancing a lot of different challenges right now. And we'll be providing regular updates as we set a more standard schedule for expanding the implementation of Oakland streets, Oakland slow streets, excuse me. Uh, so I just will turn now to I think you can go to the next slide again, Messiah. Um, to some of the questions, I just want to turn now to some of the questions that you all submitted to us um, through Thought Exchange. There we go. Thanks, Messiah. Uh, uh, so first, I want to recognize that these questions highlight to me again 
that we have a lot of work to do around community engagement when it comes to transportation improvements, even during an emergency pandemic. So the first question reads, what planning and community consulting went into the slow streets initiative? It affects hospital routes and some residents only access roads. Uh, this is not a high priority during COVID and seems to only meet demands of certain families in North Oakland. What was done to respond to East Oakland? Uh, so building off of the the bike the plan that I just shared with you all with you know thousands of people's feedback that we just did last year, I want to acknowledge again that we definitely have room for improvement in terms of community engagement. And just yesterday, uh, we in fact had a Zoom call with all of our East Oakland leaders to hear more about how we need to be holding them and building their trust as we move forward. So again, I acknowledge that and we're constantly working to you know build trust in government. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is about safety and about equity and providing residents with space to make their trips in a socially and frankly, physically distant manner across the city. So hopefully when you see that map, you can see that these streets that we're considering are spread across the entire community. And we wanna make sure that that's true moving forward. Uh, the next question we've got is, I'm dismayed that the slow street strategy has not been tried around schools like Garfield and Elmhurst where parents have died in crosswalks this year. Protecting children and families walking to and from school is worth the inconvenience of a slow street during school hours. Um, so I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge again, the real hardship that many of our East Oakland families went through and continue to go through in terms of traffic violence in their communities. And, and having visited both of those communities during that tragedy, my heart goes out to all of them again. Um, so thank you again for this comment. And we're always looking for ways to improve safety around our schools. And I hope that during this pilot phase um, of slow streets, we can find lessons learned for other projects around schools to keep kids safe, not only around schools, but frankly, helping people travel to and from school. The last comment we've got is, would love to see Lakeshore Avenue between East 18th and Lake Park added to the slow streets program. So that's actually really great feedback. I've, I've received that request a number of times in a number of ways. Uh, and so I just wanna clarify, again, this street isn't included in our slow streets network because AC Transit runs buses along this section of Lakeshore. And we wanna make sure that we're prioritizing access to public transit at the same time. But in general, um, we are always welcome and looking for streets that residents feel our DOT safety team should be considering for Oakland slow streets. So just to wrap up, um, I'd like to continue to thank our hardworking teams from Oakland's Department of Transportation, our Parks Department, our Public Parks Department, and Police and Fire Departments who are all helping us balance this amazing program that helps us you know, make more open space while avoiding creating new spaces that encourage gatherings like the mayor spared out earlier. Um, and again, I wanna thank our mayor and our council for their leadership during this period and continued support for Oakland Slow Streets Initiative. As a last PSA, please remember that the shelter in place order is still in effect. These streets are to help us maintain physical distance and public health while making essential trips in our community. We encourage Oaklanders to wear cloth face coverings when in public, and we, we will continue to monitor CDC guidance and change the program as necessary. Back to you, Mayor. Thank you so much, Warren. That was a great explanation. And um, again, I'm really proud of the work that you and the DOT are doing right now. Um, next up is Curtis Sawicki. Um, the, tonight is just like all my favorite people night, um, really. Like <laughs> literally the three of you are three of my favorite people. Um, Curtis uh, is the amazing chief of staff to the superintendent of our Oakland schools. He also has helped lead the Oakland Thrives Leadership Council, which is a collective impact effort that is really looking at total health uh, and addressing the uh, social disparities uh, or the social determinants of health uh, in Oakland. So Curtis, uh, please tell us what is going on with schools and if you could try and address some of the questions that you got uh, in advance, thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Oakland. That's wonderful to be here. Uh, and thank you for uh, participating in this forum. It was uh, really a privilege to follow Dr. Eiton and, and Warren. That was, I, I learned a lot uh, listening in and uh, helping form my work moving forward. You know, I really just wanted to start on behalf of the superintendent in the school district, 
just to really, uh, first and foremost, um, just extend our very best to all of our parents and caregivers. We know this is an unbelievably trying time, uh, both in my personal life with friends, uh, my own family, with all the parents that we've heard from. Uh, many of us and many of you are still holding down your jobs, whether that be at home virtually all day on Zoom meetings or whether that's going out to do essential frontline work. Um, uh, in many cases, while having uh, your children at home, maybe caring for other people in your family. And so we understand that um, this has caused enormous hardship on many families and everyone is doing their absolute best to uh, one, keep keep safe and keep healthy. But just wanted to really extend that, um, you know, really our, our heartfelt understanding and appreciation for all the parents and caregivers that are, are holding it down right now. And also just wanted to speak directly to our students and, and thank them for hanging in there, trying to stay connected with their peers, with their teachers, um, uh, trying to find ways uh, to stay up, uh, to continue to uh, be engaged with some type of learning. And so again, just really wanted to appreciate our, our parents and caregivers and our students uh, for uh, doing their very best during this time. I wanted to highlight uh, some of the things that OUSD is doing to respond to this pandemic. And we've really been tackling solutions in a few key areas. Uh, one is around food, uh, the other is around distance learning, and the other is just how we're supporting our highest need students and families. And I'm not sure if there's a slide up with some of our website information, but I really wanted to um, ask everyone uh, to really go to our website um, at um, www.ousd.org uh, backslash COVID-19. If you just go on our main homepage, you don't even have to do the backslash and you will. Uh, there's the, our whole banner is, says COVID-19. And if you click there, there's uh, a, every resource that we have uh, and all the information we have is up there. And there's there's probably, we have a very, very thorough FAQ that's posted there. So there's probably not a question that can come through tonight that is not already likely answered to that FAQ. I'd also just direct you to the California Department of Education website uh, that also on their homepage is full of information around everything from distance learning updates from State Superintendent Tony Thurmond around what's happening to education across the state. So those are two really outstanding uh, resources uh, for you to get uh, almost any and all information that even we have around the state of education during COVID. We started serving meals at 12 strategically located, located schools um, on the Monday, immediately following our initial decision to close schools. To date, we have served well over 700,000 meals. We've distributed 17,000 emergency food bags in partnership with the Alameda County Community Food Bank, including 25 tons of fresh produce. And we've also uh, been able to provide other supports to families such as feminine hygiene products, dental hygiene products. We're beginning a diaper um, uh, distribution program as well as um, art and school supplies for students. And we've also distributed well over 20,000 meals for adults that are accompanying students. Uh, that is being done in, in uh, partnership with Eat, Learn, Play Foundation, the World Central Kitchen and Revolution Foods. So this has been a real effort around bringing the whole community together uh, to provide food security and important um, source of nutrition for our students and families during this time. Uh, in terms of distance learning, learn what it means to learn at home and stay connected to school at home, uh, our main activity really has been to ensure that our teachers and students are in contact with each other. I think some of the things that the mayor mentioned earlier are around some of the social, emotional, and mental health uh, issues that our community is dealing with and individuals are dealing with during this extra stressful time. The real first phase of doing this is just make sure that all of our kids felt that uh, they had a sense of connection and that we still um, see them. We want to be in touch with them. Um, and as of um, March 19th, we actually had 100% uh, of our schools share their individual school plans online. So every school had already activities and uh, plans up 
for the initial couple of weeks of the school closure. We also distributed thousands of copies, hard copy of home learning packets as well. Uh, our biggest effort is to really bridge the technology gap. Uh, to date, 70 of our 85 schools have been distributed over 15,000 Chromebooks. Our partner Tech Exchange that the mayor uh, mentioned earlier has distributed an additional 315 laptops, 292 tablets, and 71 hotspots. We are partnering with the mayor's office, the Oakland Public Education Fund, and Tech Exchange to continue to get more students connected as quickly as we can. Uh, by the end of tomorrow, all remaining OUSD schools will hold their Chromebook distribution, and uh, we're going to see what that total looks like, uh, but we're anticipating that we're still going to have a gap of about 4,000 students that need really immediate connection. And that's what we're working on diligently to, to try to close that. The other, um, the last piece I'll mention briefly is that we know that, um, as Dr. Eiten stated and Warren actually mentioned as well, that the inequities and the disparities that are exist and have existed in our community are just exacerbated by this pandemic. And we know that many of our most vulnerable families are really severely impacted in terms of uh, the first to lose employment um, and to be grappling with other issues. We partnered with the Oakland um, Ed Fund immediately and launched a COVID rapid relief fund. Uh, we've already um, distributed $600,000 of direct cash assistance uh, to uh, an emphasis on our newcomer um, and immigrant population, as well as our um, underhoused and homeless families. And we're going to continue to raise money uh, to provide direct assistance to um, as many families as we possibly can. I'll, um, I'll transition as Warren did to uh, take on a few questions that, that came through the, uh, the, the town hall initially. And there are three that I, I just kind of grouped together that were themes. Uh, the big one, of course, is when will school resume in person? And uh, my answer is short, we are not certain. Um, as you know from the daily news, uh, that information is emerging about how businesses and schools will reopen. Reopen. We've been in regular communication with uh, the California Department of Ed, our county office of Ed and other districts across the state uh, to really be informed and to be part of the conversation around uh, when and how to reopen school. Um, that led to the second question, which is what can families expect when they do return to school? And I think, I uh, hope many of you uh, heard the governor's press conference this week when he began to um, shed some light on uh, some preliminary ideas as to what it might look like. For example, staggered start times and schedules to limit the number of students in a building at any given time, um, not holding large events in multi-purpose rooms, auditoriums, and sports um, venues. And so uh, we will continue to work with our leaders and health experts to understand and implement the behaviors, practices, and protocols that we'll need to have in place to return to our schools safely. And most importantly, um, to reconnect face-to-face -face with our students and families. And the last question, um, with schools closed, what supports are students getting, especially given vast inequities in many of our communities? Our main activity, at least initially, where we have the most reach is ensuring that our teachers and students are connecting. This lifeline to our students is critical and underscores the importance of our teachers in the lives of students. That personal connection is the foundation for any distance learning uh, for our students to actually know that somebody knows they're out there, that they're connecting with them and that they still have a community to engage with around their lives and their learning. Our coordination of services teams, every Oakland school has a cost team and the responsibility of those cost teams is to actually accept referrals and take up the needs of families and students and connect them with the right resources and supports and to support the families along the way. We're still, those coordination of services teams are still in action and providing uh, the resources. Our newcomer and homeless student family services case managers and teams are doing all they can to continue to reach out and be in touch with our families. Three of our school-based health centers re remain open. 
And many of our mental health providers in the community continue to provide mental health services to our students through telehealth. And with that, I will kick it back to the mayor to um, bring us into the Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Curtis. Um, just on a personal note, as the parent of two OUSD students, I can tell you they're doing a lot more homework this week. So the distance learning uh, is at least working in our household, although again, we recognize how uh, it just shines a bright light on the digital divide, which is another yes. opportunity, another learning that I hope we get as we come out of this crisis. Um, at this point, we want to invite you to ask us some questions. Um, again, join the conversation, click on the link, scan the QR code, text. Um, while you do that, I am going to answer a few of the unassigned questions that we received prior to tonight's town hall. But I encourage you while I'm talking to please go and add any questions that you haven't gotten answered yet. Or if you wanna hear more from one of these fabulous speakers, please send us your thoughts. Uh, I'm gonna start, I have a question. Alameda County has one of the highest per capita incidences of COVID-19, what's being done to make testing more widely available. I did give an update on testing um, at the beginning. Again, we have mobile testing. We have two city run sites that are free and open to everyone who is working or volunteering out of the house or has been exposed to someone who has COVID. But what I want to correct is that Alameda County does not have one of the highest per capita incident incidences of COVID-19. We are actually below the state average. Right now, the infection rate in California is 6.7, and Alameda County is at 54.8. So we are just below the average uh, for California counties. Uh, I got a question about uh, and, and again, I just want to emphasize a question about the restarting the economy. I think we talked about that a little bit. Dr. Uh, Eiden also touched on this. It will not just be testing. We are going to have to start very comprehensive and labor intensive contact tracing. That is going to be a big part of when we can go back to life as usual. Um, I got a lot of questions about Lake Merritt uh, and are you re considering requiring the use of face masks when social distancing isn't possible. I think it's very important people know that wearing a face mask still requires you to social distance. It also is important you do not touch your face when you're putting your face mask on and off. Your face mask is really to protect others more than you. You must continue to social distance. We are working to put a lot more signage around Lake Merritt, and I see a lot of requests for more enforcement. We have begun to take down basketball hoops and soccer goals uh, in parks where we've seen people continuing to play uh, team sports. So we are trying to do things to keep people off of surfaces or in sports, but still keep our beautiful parks and particularly Lake Merritt open but I will follow up on those requests for more education and warnings. Um, someone said that they're a mental health professional and would love to volunteer their services. Again, I encourage you to email communityengagement510 at, at gmail.com. Again, communityengagement510 at gmail.com and tell us what your special skills are or the type of volunteer project you're looking for. Uh, we have a question on how much is the city spending on COVID response? Uh, the question is, I, I don't know offhand, but what I can tell you is that we are very carefully tracking. We code every uh, expenditure that we make that uh, has, has a, a COVID relation uh, in the hopes that we will be getting FEMA reimbursement. I can tell you, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, that the city budget is going to be terribly impacted by this health crisis. Uh, we are anticipating a $32 million deficit in this fiscal year, more than $50 million in the next because of lost sales tax, hotel tax, and other types of revenues. 
So please, uh, as, as I know people want to get aid and help from the city, know that we are having our own financial crisis ourselves. Uh, someone asked about preserving open government. It is true that during the crisis, the city council is not having committee meetings anymore. And they are only noticing uh, council actions on a three day notice. Uh, I encourage you if you want more process to contact your council members. I, I believe that we do need transparency uh, and thoughtful decision making even during a crisis when issues are not related to the health crisis. Um, uh, someone is asked as a sole proprietor, they're having uh, trouble getting funding to keep themselves and their businesses above water. Uh, someone else said, I need help now. <laughs> what, what funding and or loans can I apply for? Uh, I encourage everyone to go to the city's website, oaklandca.gov. But if you are a small business owner, and that includes sole proprietor, go to oaklandbusinesscenter.com, oaklandbusinesscenter.com. Uh, and fill out our business impact survey, you will be contacted personally by a, a live human being to walk you through what resources would be appropriate for you. So please, oaklandbusinesscenter.com. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of the Kiva loans. They're very easy to get. There are no interest or fees. They're quick fifteen thousand uh, dollars and they uh you are not uh, required to start any repayment for at least six months um i think there was another question about using hotel and motel rooms we are attempting to do that for the unhoused i do want to make people aware though there is a tremendous cost uh, some of which is fema reimbursed but some of which is not to um, placing people in hotels and it is not uh humane or compassionate to just put people in hotels. Uh, we want to be sure that they are getting fed, that their rooms are being cleaned, that they are getting medical attention. Uh, it, it is the intake process takes uh, some time. So please have patience with us. Um, my last question, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Eiten. And I know it sounds like we're getting um, some coming through, but I, I, I texted Dr. Eiten a couple that I also got question about our community land trusts and income-based affordable small site construction projects allowed to continue during the stay at home order. Uh, and, and that is partially correct. While most construction has been ordered stopped, the uh, health order does allow the continuation of housing projects with at least 10% of affordable units. And so those uh, projects are continuing construction. Um, you know, Oak Oakland, uh, we, we recognize that the affordable housing crisis is also a health crisis. And we fully support the continued construction, frankly, of all housing, but particularly projects that are creating or funding affordable housing. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Eiten. I sent you a couple questions, and then we'll share the screen and see what what came in from from the the internet uh, as far as questions. Okay, I'm I'm going to just read these questions out. Now, uh, there's a question from uh, Luis from Facebook, um, who said, "I tested positive and am living with my family. I need a place to isolate myself." My children need to be tested to see if they are negative or positive. I don't know what to do. I need help. Um, first of all, Luis, um, there's help out there. Um, so we'll find you help. Um, it may take a few phone calls. It may take a few referrals, but we'll find you some help. Uh, one of the uh, resources that you should check out immediately is the Alameda County Public Health Department, uh, which is acphd.org. And they list uh, a long list of resources uh, for folks that are experiencing um, this kind of question and these kinds of circumstances. Um, there's also a, um, a COVID housing uh, website that you can go to uh, at Alameda County, which is uh, COVID housing uh, at acgov.org. Um, and they can also uh, direct you to some resources. I, I should tell you, Luis, that um, you can stay in your home. 
um, and isolate if, if you've got some space in your home and maybe that's not the case. But if you do, you can self-isolate in a room in your home, practice very good hand hygiene, um, wear a face mask, and, and essentially social distance yourself to the extent that you can from other family members. Uh, many people have done that and are doing that. Um, if you are um, feeling very sick and you feel you need a medical evaluation, um, and if you don't have a doctor and you don't have insurance, that's fine. You can call um, any of our uh, community health centers in Alameda County or in the city of Oakland, La Clinica, um, and they can arrange to see you and evaluate you and uh, make recommendations uh, if they think you need to go to a hospital or, or not. Most people who get infected with COVID do not go to the hospital. Um, you do not need to need a hospital. There's no treatment at the hospital for mild or even moderate COVID that will make a difference. Um, your body will treat this with its own immunity uh, over time and those few people who whose bodies get overwhelmed with the virus, they need the hospital, typically oxygen, and then um, a ventilator if, if they really do get overwhelmed. But that's a relatively small percentage of people. Um, most likely you will not be one of those people. Um, and you can self-isolate uh, at home quite effectively as, as many thousands of people are actually doing right now. Thank you, and you don't forget, Luis, that your family members can get tested for free at the two City of Oakland testing sites. Again, you can uh, go to, uh, sit, uh, I'm sorry, oaklandca.gov slash testing. And then Tony, you got a question for, also from someone who is worried, uh, if I show up at a hospital, am I just gonna get a big bill I can't pay? Yeah, well, first of all, I strongly encourage you not to just show up at a hospital. Um, that, that is a, a, a bad idea for multiple reasons, including the risk of receiving a big bill. Um, you, you really do need to get in touch with a, a, a local clinic if you feel like you're symptomatic. If you're having an emergency, obviously go to the emergency room. Um, but if you feel like you're symptomatic, get on the phone and call La Clinica, call the West Oakland Health Center, um, call uh, Asian Health Services, call Ruth's Community Health Center, um, Oakland is blessed with a, just a, a, a rich, uh, diverse uh, system of community health centers who will treat you without cost um, and, and help direct you to services that um, essentially are free or extremely low cost. So um, don't just show up at the hospital. Um, that, that really is, is not the way to manage this unless you know, you're in an ambulance and you really need to get to the hospital, in which case um, just do whatever the ambulance driver tells you to do. Uh, for the most part, you should be able to avoid going to the hospital uh, in, in, in the COVID crisis. And, and our fingers are all crossed for all of us, obviously, that uh, none of us has to end up uh, in the hospital. Thank you, Dr. Eiten. So I understand that um, the thought exchange has happened and then we're we're gonna see a screen soon with some questions and we'll all just do our best to answer whatever comes up. All right, here it comes. All right, what are the city's priorities? Um, our priority is health and life. Uh, and and I, I have been very proud of the Bay Area that we have been unapologetic about putting health and life before profits, before our economy. And I know that that has been hard and in some cases criticized, uh, but that that has been um, our, our value. Uh, I think our other value is, is equity. Uh, as we come out of this, we really want to think about what, how can we create a, a more fair society, a society that's guided by um, our principles of fairness, of compassion, um, and, and that, and, and that Kind of, uh, I think that's part of Oakland's values. Uh, we can we can talk about the city's kind of overreaching priorities of of holistic community safety, of housing uh, and income and cultural security, of a trustworthy and responsive government, and of vibrant and sustainable infrastructure. Those those are my priorities as the mayor. Uh, they guide me at all times. 
Uh, and I, I think that they are actually still relevant even in this health pandemic. Um, so it says resources regarding helping people stay in Oakland. My mother passed recently, so major family transition involving housing. Uh, Oakland's Housing Assistance Center uh, does remain open by phone. And also, if you are struggling to stay housed because you have been unable to pay rent or you've fallen behind in your utilities, know that uh, Oakland and, and most of California, although Oakland has been called the strongest in the entire state, has an eviction moratorium in place. Again, just to be clear, if you can pay rent, we encourage you to pay rent. Many landlords uh, are, re are uh, relying on that. But if you cannot, you cannot be evicted for it at this time and for quite some time to come. Uh, also, another question about uh, helping catch up on rent as we transition out of lockdown. That is something that has not been formalized with the city of Oakland. I know we're looking at some of the programs San Francisco uh, have passed. Uh, for right now, we are focused on preventing evictions uh, I think you will see more legislative action from the council to try and structure uh, the, the catch-up provisions. But do know that our rent assistance program does have mediators uh, available to help mediate these types of agreements between tenants and landlords. So that is a service that is available through the city of Oakland. Uh, how are we making sure everyone has food? Curtis, I'm going to let you talk about that because I think our school district has done one of the most amazing jobs of keeping our families fed. I mean, how how many meals do you guys distribute each week? Well, we've already distributed probably after today 750,000 meals. Uh, we're serving about 15,000 families um, each distribution day. Uh, and there's also a lot, uh, there's a lot of partners in Oakland that are working with everything from our seniors and Meals on Wheels to our students and their families, uh, trying to get more meals uh, and food access to as many families as possible. That's why we've opened up our distribution sites and have really partnered with the, um, the Alameda County Funding Bank to ramp up the amount of emergency groceries, fresh produce and other items that are going out. We actually just opened our central kitchen in partnership with the food bank for another uh, point to bring food into, package it and get it out to the community. So it's a, it's a, uh, another really important part of kind of the infrastructure to make sure it continue to make sure that everyone has food. Um, we also through again, um, generous donations to the Oakland fund we have uh, roughly doubled the Meals on Wheels distribution in Oakland. We have World Central Kitchen also providing three meals a day for our at, at encampments and at all of our shelter facilities. So um, a huge effort, but know that we're gonna be increasing that effort. Again, our governor, who I think has been exhibiting uh, very good leadership in, in contrast perhaps to other national leaders, um, our governor was able to secure from FEMA the agreement to reimburse restaurants that are preparing and delivering meals to seniors who are living alone and not using another federal food program. So we are waiting for more guidance and criteria about that, and we will be sharing that with you as soon as it becomes available. Um, I want you to keep scrolling again, oaklandca.gov slash testing for information about testing sites. How many cases are in Oakland? Let me look that up unless Dr. Eiten knows it off the top of, of his head, or I can look it up while Dr. Eiten answers the question for him. Yeah, so the next question is, um, other vulnerable populations death rates are much lower than black and neither are being targeted by police for wearing masks. There must be a focus on African-Americans without clumping together all others. You have no problem with undocumented focus, but you do it with blacks. That sounds more like a statement to me. I'm not sure um, if there's a question in there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll take the next one about the homeless population and you can keep scrolling. 
Uh, what happened to the hotel that's renting to them? Uh, again, uh, two hotels have already agreed to rent their entire hotels. Uh, initially, they were contacted by the state of California, but those leases were turned over to Alameda County. Now, at least one of those hotels is is a is a tourist hotel that serves, you know, particularly airport. Uh, pa passengers. So when this health crisis is over and that FEMA reimbursement is done, um, it is unlikely that that hotel will be available to house our homeless. And that is why in the city of Oakland, we are focusing on hotels that may be available to buy once the health crisis is over. We have a tremendous need in Oakland for uh, room and board facilities, for uh, supportive housing for our seniors um, that need permanent affordable housing and some level of care. And so that's the type of opportunity that we're looking at. Uh, it is true though that FEMA does not pay 100% of the costs of operating these hotels for our unsheltered folks. And so that is part of the financial decisions we are also um, making. Dr. Eiten, I think the next question is for you about household isolation pods. Yeah, I, I, I think I know what this is. This is when two households come together. Um, try to understand there, this, there's a concept called biome, which is basically sort of a shared household um, uh, kind of set of bacteria and, and, and um, any kind of bugs that live within a family. Um, and so the question is sort of, you know, can I join my biome with uh, another biome? And the answer is yes, uh, you can, um, but you, you really need to ensure that that other household has been essentially socially isolated uh, for 14 days uh, at a minimum. And, um, and then you, you can actually interact with them and, and, and that you have been socially isolated for 14 days, you and your family. You can combine those households. You are still taking some risk. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, but the, in, in theory, if you've had 14 days of, of isolation uh, away from, um, you know, any potential source of, of contamination with COVID-19, then yes, you can combine um, a household biomes. And um, some of my neighbors have done that. Uh, my daughters uh, have done that. So yes, you can do that. Uh, Warren, I think the next, I'm sorry, not Warren. Um, <laughs> uh, Curtis, the question for you about personalized learning. Uh, yes, for this question, I mean, thank the questioner for sharing that I've actually been trying to keep up with a lot of things come out of the New York Times, the Atlantic, et cetera. I haven't seen this one, but I'm going to read it. Um, our website does have a number of uh, virtual platforms for students to engage in, uh, things that are offered by PBS, KQED. Uh, there's a number of wonderful resources that are up there. That is in addition to all of the personalized learning plans by grade level, by school that our teachers have developed. Our goal is that our teachers are engaging with students um, in our Google Classroom and other platforms that they're training in and using with our students and that our network of Chromebooks is connected to, but there's also a number of other open source types of resources that are out there that families can use to augment and to have their students engage in starting, you know, as early as three and four year old types of activities. Um, and there's good guidance out there around young people of not having, you know, three and four year olds spending more than an hour of screen time a day, elementary kids upwards of an hour and a half to two hours at the most middle school students, two to three hours and high school students around three to four and a half hours maximum. So the goal is not that students live on a screen all day, but that it's it's a part of their learning that there's other things with them reading and, and doing some other things with their hands and, um, and other activities as well. So thank you for sharing that article. I'll read it and, and uh, please go to our website to see what some of those personalized learning uh, platforms look like. Yeah, I have a, a Khan Academy attic in my house. Yes, right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he loves math. Um, I, I do want to answer the previous question. Uh, today's most recent update for Oakland, 242 confirmed cases of COVID in Oakland. The number of deaths is not reported at that time. My understanding is that means it is fewer than 10. Uh, Alameda County for 
purposes of privacy uh, does not report cases fewer than 10. It is also my understanding that that is true of the total number of countywide cases in the homeless population. I, I do know people have passed away in the city of Oakland. Um, I certainly lost my first friend um, within the last week, Mr. Gene Zahas, an incredible community volunteer. Curtis, I'm sure you knew him. He was an amazing advocate for our public school system. Will be deeply lost and, yes. and our condolences go out to everyone who has lost friends and family yes. or are, are sitting in fear uh, of losing them. Uh, just quickly on empty houses before we move on to Warren. Um, again, there is a cost to using property for the homeless. Uh, the government does not have the ability to just commandeer without a cost. The government has to pay far, fair market value. Uh, it also has to run these buildings, pay the utilities and the water. Um, and then also it is irresponsible for us to have vulnerable people without care or, or meals. And so we are uh, constantly evaluating the most cost-effective situations. These hotel and motel conversions really seem to be a very effective model both in the short term and possibly in the long term, as far as getting our homeless into safe and healthy environments. Warren, question about someone's street. How, how do they get their street on the list? Sure, that's a great question. Um, the first thing you can do is tell me what street it is. Uh, the second is that I welcome anyone listening or watching to visit our website. It's, it's actually in the chat on the side. Um, and if you just Google Oakland slow streets, it should be right at the top. Uh, and we are actually evaluating lots of different streets as we speak. So we're, we're taking in feedback from our community. We're welcoming ideas from different residents and people throughout Oakland who can share, hey, you know, our street should be one of these streets. I, I've heard this a number of times and our safety team is happy to evaluate any one of those streets. So bring it on. Um, Dr. Iden, do you wanna answer the question about um privacy within the healthcare setting, uh, the question about yeah. someone believes someone had, had the illness, but, but they can't get that information? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm surmising from that question, you know, that, that there was an exposure or presumed exposure. And uh, the people that were exposed are, maybe I'll just read it so that the audience knows what I'm talking about. Um, continued from the previous comment, Oakland Fire non-emergency were asked if we could have updates regarding this man's possible COVID illness and were told that we could not due to privacy. How do we know we were not exposed? Advice to consult personal health care worker, question um, mark. So I, I, again, I'm reading a little bit into this. Um, so typically the information flow goes from the patient to whoever the patient wants to disclose to. Um, and if there, there was a documented exposure to a, um, a, a, a confirmed patient, then the public health department would traditionally reach out to known contacts of that patient and, um, and, and, and do what's called contact tracing. So in the process of that contact tracing, uh, the person, presumably this fire um, you know, personnel, would be informed that they were exposed to a confirmed case and be given instructions as to how to essentially quarantine themselves to avoid um, spreading it to anybody else because we know about asymptomatic spread of COVID-19 and to watch for symptoms in themselves uh, as well. But if you think you are exposed to somebody, you don't have the right to essentially get that person's medical records. Um, that's federal law. It's also California privacy law. Um, the way the information has to flow, the, the patient has to disclose it or give permission to have that disclosed uh, to another person. So even the public health department will not tell you who the patient was. Uh, they will tell you that um, they have information that you were exposed to a confirmed case. Um, they may give you some information about when and where that happened. Uh, but they will not tell you who that person is and they will not tell you any details about that person due to uh, medical privacy laws, which are very strict, uh, both in California and in the United States. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, um, 
I'm going to uh, look up some answers because I do have some information. I just need to look it up in my email about our returning community members, again, our, our formerly incarcerated uh, residents. Uh, I'm going to look that up in a second. So let me um, uh, get, go back to Curtis. How are we support, supporting students who hate distance learning? They have no voice in any of this. It's a great question. <laughs> Uh, we did start holding um, town hall style meetings similar to this with our students. We had um, uh, a few hundred high school students on a, a town hall with the superintendent and some of our staff to really hear the students' voice around, around uh, what their concerns are, what their questions are, what's working, what's not working for them. And so, you know, for us, I believe that's an important part of how we're all learning together around how to uh, do distance learning together and how to respond to this. And so, you know, hopefully part of what's happening in our teacher contacts with students and as our principals are having contact is that we are hearing from students that we can adjust and see what things we can do better to, to kids stay connected. Um, my other thought about this is possibly the hate for distance learning is not that most kids don't like spending time on the screen, but they might be really missing their friends. Right? There's a huge social aspect of being in school, so you're missing all that common time to be with your friends. And learning is a social um, activity. It's not just something that we do alone. Um, uh, that's something, you know, even in our work worlds, when people are, you know, sitting in rooms on, on Zoom, that we're, we're missing that personal connection. And so, um, you know, the, the best we can do to help students feel connected, connect with their peers and their classmates uh, through technology um, uh, and other means, I think will hopefully um, mitigate a little bit the haters <laughs> of distance learning. And, and I can appreciate that. It's, it's a little more sedentary than being in school, uh, but I appreciate the question. And it just uh, makes reminds me that we need to double down on our efforts to hear more from students. I have a little bit of an update on um, our formerly incarcerated. Uh, the governor issued an executive order direct, directing uh, the Department of Corrections to temporarily halt the intake and or transfer of inmates into state prisons uh, or juvenile justice centers. Uh, also to expedite the transition to parole for eligible inmates who have 60 days or less to serve their sentences. Um, our understanding that there's approximately 3,500 inmates who are eligible for expedited release in the whole state of California. And uh, we are aware of about 39 who have been identified, 39 uh, as being paroled or placed um, on uh, supervision to the city of Oakland. Now we are continuing to get more additional information, but again, we are uh, quickly looking for resources to ensure that we are supporting these individuals that are returning here. Um, that is definitely our philosophy and our value. Uh, and I did talk uh, earlier tonight about our partnership with Ruth's Community Clinic and the mobile outreach that we are doing to ensure that our returning and formerly incarcerated neighbors and residents uh, do have access to testing and that we're actually not waiting for them to come to our testing centers, that we are actually sending mobile testing out into the community. Warren, you have been working your patootie off uh, in, in putting up <laughs> these testing sites. Can you add um, a little bit more detail and information for people? Um, this, I, I want to commend Warren Resilience Officer, Alexandria McBride. Uh, they, are, they are not testing center experts, uh, but we prioritize this for our community. One of the very first grants that we received through the Oakland Fund this is how we decided to use it. And in Northern California, Oakland was the very first city to put up a testing site. Uh, we started, and Lauren, talk about how we worked with CDC guidelines and how we've prioritized and opened up as, as we've had capacity. I think people are really interested to understand how we've approached testing in Oakland. Absolutely, Mayor. Thank you for the accolades. Um, we have started with the CDC guidance that shared with us a couple of weeks ago how important it was to prioritize certain populations based on their exposure. And I forgive me, doctor, if, if I'm gonna take some of your points that you might share later, um, that they shared with us, the CDC did that because testing was limited, access to testing was limited, and because our hospitals were soon to be you know, uh, in high demand, we wanted to make sure 
that people that had access to testing were from the beginning our first responders. So that's our police and fire. Because those are the folks who are making so many interactions with our most vulnerable populations. Of course, Oakland doesn't stop there. We wanted to make sure that we were consistently expanding our you know, available, excuse me, availability to testing to frontline responders. So that's everybody in our um, public agencies and, and across the board who are, again, making those connections with vulnerable populations. We then said, okay, let's add more. Um, and so just to give you a sense of timing here, Alex McBride, my awesome partner and I, you know, in, in crime really, we every day think of what, what crazy thing can we do next? And so each day we're trying to expand the testing more and more and more. And so we expanded from our frontline responders to our direct care providers. People have been so thoughtful in sharing with us their stories of, of thanks and, and really praise for that peace of mind that they are able to get tested if they need to. And, and I'm really proud to partner with the mayor, of course, to expand that test now to anybody who's leaving their house um, for work. So that if you feel like you are, sorry, if you feel like you are, you know, leaving your home for an essential service and you need to get tested and you, and you might be symptomatic, call our hotline number and, you know, hopefully get tested. Um, and again, thanks to so many people for reaching out to us to continuously, you know, stretch this program to its fullest potential. Um, if we find that more people need to get tested other than people who are going outside, we're happy to consider that as well. Again, in partnership with Brown and Tolan, with the CDC and the county as well. Thanks. Um, I, you know, this is a great example of our public servants are like doing five jobs right now. They are working night and day, all weekend long. Uh, Warren and Ivana came and borrowed my minivan to put out the barriers and the signage for slow streets last weekend. Um, it really is an amazing, uh, just show of the nobility of public service and how committed your city of Oakland workers are to this community. Uh, we got a question about seniors and, and Dr. Eiden, I don't know if you'll have anything to add because we know that nursing homes and senior residence facilities are particularly vulnerable locations. Uh, the, the health order prohibits any visitation, which I know is really hard on families with, with a small exception for end of life. Uh, but I did talk about how we've prioritized expanding Meals on Wheels to our seniors, how we are going to be prioritizing our seniors for the great Oakland check-in, um, you know, personal phone calls and wellness checks, uh, as well as we are anxious to get going on the governor's announced program for seniors who don't have meal delivery right now to be able to take advantage of that from local restaurants also potentially a life-saving program for some of our local restaurants. Dr. Eiton, do you have anything else to add about how we are working with seniors in this moment? No, I, I, I don't have anything to add to that. I, I would note that this check-in program that uh, you've designed is, is really very thoughtful. Um, you know, this is exactly the kind of activity we need during a pandemic. There are many socially isolated, lonely seniors who may be struggling getting food, may be struggling getting their medicine. They may have issues going on with their home that they can't manage themselves. Uh, they may have some memory issues. Uh, so checking in on, on, on that very vulnerable population is absolutely what we should be doing now. And that, that shows the strength of this community. Thank you. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know if you want to chime in on this question as well, Dr. Eiton, but how long will the lockdown last? The sure. answer is we don't know. And I right. think that the next phase of this is, is in some ways going to be even harder than the one that we're in. Uh, you know, as we saw this ramp up and explode, you know, the lockdown was very clear and, and certain and dramatic. And what I think, and, and Dr. Eiden, you can confirm this, but as, as the governor, and, and again, he has made himself extremely accessible to the big city mayors in California. We, we have had regular briefings with him and his top staff um, on a regular basis. But but talk about how we're, we're, the peak is not just like the only peak. We're gonna have some peaks and valleys and some rolling hills and the, the kind of level of constraint 
uh, and release is, is going to change and not be very predictable. Is, is that a fair way to describe it, Dr. Eiten? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, this is literally a trillion dollar question is, you know, how do we come out of the other end of this thing? And, and let me just point out a couple of things that you need to think about um, in making this decision that we all need to think about. One is that right now we don't have good capacity for some of the critical functions that we need uh, to be able to manage this uh, the way we would traditionally manage an infectious disease outbreak. So we're lacking uh, adequate personal protective equipment, not everywhere, but as a state, shortages of masks and face shields and gowns uh, that the healthcare system needs to be able to do this. So we need to ensure that we have adequate capacity of personal protective equipment as, as one core capacity. Two, uh, we still don't have, although Oakland is doing a great job, but across the state, we're, we still don't have the testing capacity uh, that we need to be able to manage any kind of spot fires, if you will. I mean, they think of this as sort of like a, a wildfire. And once you have it contained, uh, wildfires can throw embers and you've got to get to those embers and stamp them out. And the way that you do that in an infectious disease outbreak is you test. You have to have a sense of how much disease is still circulating in the community. So the second capacity we need is testing capacity. It needs to be doubly and triply redundant. We have to be able to test everybody that we want to test. We want to test even asymptomatic people to figure out whether there's any background of virus and transmission going on that we can't see because they're asymptomatic. The third thing we need is we need to make sure our hospital capacity is, is, is sufficient, um, that we have enough ventilators, that we have enough hospital beds right now because of the great work that folks in the Bay Area did and across California in sheltering in place and, and flattening the curve. Uh, we actually, our capacity is holding out, but we want to build that capacity just in case, um, you know, we have another uh, surge of cases and our hospitals uh, start to see a lot of pressure. And then um, the fourth thing we need, and this is in some ways closest to my heart, is we need the local public health capacity to do that case tracking and contact tracing to be able to figure out um, you know, how to contain this once we come out on the other end. So there are at least four capacities that we need to ensure are adequate and more than just adequate, they have to be absolutely um, you know, capable of, of, of withstanding another surge of cases. So that's personal protective equipment, that's testing ability, that's hospital capacity, and that's local public health department a capacity. And then the fifth thing is, we have to be in that part of the curve where we definitely can say that the cases are on their way down. Uh, we can't do this during the plateau. We can't do this when the cases are still climbing. So we have to be on, on that part of the curve. Right now, we believe that the peak in California will be sometime in mid-May. We're already seeing a slowing and flattening of the curve, which is good but we'll continue to see kind of a plateau probably for a couple of weeks before we start to see some sort of decline. So I personally can't imagine any uh, aggressive efforts to open up the economy uh, before the very end of May, beginning of June. There's possible um, exceptions to that. There may be some ways to slowly start opening up the economy. Um, and folks are trying to figure that out. Three states are working together on the West Coast to try to figure out what that might look like. Uh, seven or so states on the East Coast are trying to figure out what that might look like. But certainly no movement on this until we have those capacities in place and until we see a start, a start to see a decline uh, in the daily cases um, that are being registered by the state. Wow, thank you for explaining that so well. Uh, that was great. Um, the question about uh, homeless youth, um, if, if, if you, first of all, I, I want to commend, I know also last week, the governor passed some um, extra assistance for foster youth. So please look into that. In general, uh, if you know someone who is homeless or who needs some sort of social service or assistance, um, please call 211. Uh, in Oakland, our youth shelter is called Covenant House. It's down in the Jack London Square area. But the best way to get connected to whatever services are needed are 211. Um, the, the, the questioner said that they were worried this 
a young person might turn to trafficking. Um, again, that just is not acceptable. The Alameda County Family Justice Center has tremendous resources around that particular issue. Uh, but please connect anyone that you love who needs help getting uh, social services to 211. Curtis. Um, I don't know if you also have additional resources for an 18 year old foster child who's uh, coming out of juvenile hall, but also the next question is clearly for you, the uh, mother of a, a of six, including a six month old girl, an asthmatic boy and a special needs boy. Um, if, if I think both Dr. Iden and uh, Curtis uh, might have contributions for this question. I'll let Dr. Eiten start around the benefit uh, piece. If he might have an answer around that. My understanding is that there's a freeze on, on discontinuing benefits in Alameda County. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure about that. So um, I would encourage the, the person who submitted that question to get in touch with their, presumably their caseworker, uh, at the Department of Social Services in the county and uh, make sure that that caseworker is aware that there is a moratorium on, on, on discontinuing benefits uh, in this moment. So um, th that's, that's my understanding. Yeah, and I, I would just add that um, I don't have the direct link on our website, but you can go on our website and um, under our foster youth services, we do have case managers. Uh, they could likely know uh, the family, but that's another, um, possible resource to to get connected to. And I, um, did, did, were you able to see the other question before it got scrolled up about the mother of six? No, I, I missed that. Let me just, can you go back to that question? There. Right. I know an Oakland mother of six. Oh, okay. Yeah. Six okay. Six-month-old I got it. girl, mm -hmm. asthmatic boy, and a special needs boy. Her county benefits have been cut off and she needs food. The, the governor said no one will be cut off of their benefits during COVID, but this is one of several I know that have and are hungry right now. So, so Kurt, I would encourage you to immediately go to our website, the 12, there's a map with each of our 12 sites uh, that are actually um, providing food uh, and there's free meals each time that uh, the family goes, they're able to get meals for three days. Um, and I would encourage you, and I'm looking right now to actually give you the names of our sites that are across each of the communities, but go on our website and there is a map of each of our distribution sites. I would encourage you to go there and uh, to get food. If, um, if that's not the case, um, I actually just want to give this mom like my personal cell phone right now because there's some other resources I can actually, and I don't know if there's a way that I could um, like type in my cell phone in the chat and our moderator could get this mom my phone number because I'd like to connect her uh, possibly with the, find out what um, school her kids went to, connect her with our nursing services and some of our other services that we have. So I'm going to type my number in the chat and see if there's a way that we can possibly connect with this mom and get her. So like, rather than sending her around the websites, I'm happy to have someone talk to her personally. Wow, thank you, Curtis. That is incredible of you. Um, Dr. Eiten, uh, this question is similar to a previous one, but I think it's worth repeating. Someone is tested positive and living with their family. How, how can they get their children tested? How, how can they isolate themselves? Yeah, I, I, I think this may in fact be the same question. Um, but the first of all, um, you, you're going to get through this. Don't worry about it. Um, there's a lot of resources around that will help take care of you. Most people who test positive uh, will not get very sick. Um, and even if you get sick, it's unlikely that you're going to need to go to a hospital. Most people who tested positive are isolating in their homes and protecting themselves from their families. So all of the advice that we give people about um, trying to avoid getting the virus also applies to those who have the virus who don't want to give it to other people. So uh, very, very uh, strict hand washing. Um, wear a uh, face cover, a mask if you have one, 
in your home and try to maintain six feet of social distance, keep surfaces uh, well cleaned, uh, soap and water is fine. Uh, you can use uh, you know, Clorox uh, sprays or, or bleach agents, um, but soap and water is fine. And essentially avoid your family um, you know, for as long as you're ill and then uh, for several days after your symptoms subside. Um, I, I just wanna make it clear to you that it's, this is very common. There are many thousands of people who are experiencing what you're experiencing, isolating themselves in their homes, and they're able not to transmit it to their families by adopting these um, very uh, strict hygiene regimens and making sure everybody in the household understands um, you know, how to avoid coming into contact with either um, surfaces that you have uh, inadvertently contaminated or um, with you directly, either your cough or your sneeze, or in some cases, even breathing or singing or, or yelling can actually expel virus into the air. So keep your uh, mouth covered um, uh, as much as you can in your home and try to maintain social distance in your home from your loved ones. All right, we're gonna do these last three and then we're gonna wrap it up. You all have kept us busy tonight with your questions. The question is, if someone is in the citizenship application process, will accepting government help during the crisis count against them? So let me be very, very clear. The city of Oakland, the Oakland Unified School District, and the state of California are sanctuary governments. That means we do not care what your immigration status is. The difference is with the federal government. But uh, I just want you to know that if you are getting assistance from the city, from any of the school districts, food distribution sites, no one will ask you what your citizenship status is. And again, the Oakland police do not cooperate with ICE, do not participate in any way with immigration enforcement. So please, we care about all of our community members here in Oakland. We are proud to be a sanctuary city. We are unapologetic about it. And we are absolutely here to support your family in this moment. If you have specific questions, I encourage you to contact Centro Legal de la Raza. And they have legal advisors that can give you more specifics. And you can put that in the chat. Warren, please take us home. The last two questions I think are good ones for you. Uh, How Mayor, much have you could, spent if, on closing if, the streets since you borrowed my minivan last weekend? <laughs> I'm sorry. Can I add something, Mayor, to the uh, public purge please, issue? Please, please. Um, the federal government, the USCIS, I think is the, the Immigration and Naturalization Services, have said publicly that they plan on not enforcing the public charge rules during the COVID crisis. And so you can take that with a grain of salt. Um, we recognize who the federal administration is and their, you know, their, their clear um, agenda. However, they have said publicly that they plan not on enforcing public charge during uh, COVID. So at least on, on paper, they're suggesting that they're, um, they're holding off on enforcing that rule. Uh, for folks that are seeking assistance during the COVID crisis. Yeah. But a lot of these benefits are coming from the state government anyway, which I believe you can trust in this moment. Fair? All right, I see, I see Dr. Eight nodding. All right, uh, Warren, you're gonna answer our last two questions. I wanna thank everybody. We We are at eight o'clock, but let's try and quickly wrap these last two questions up. More came in than we were able to answer tonight. We will prepare an FAQ based on your questions and we will be posting that uh, for everyone to see. So Warren, take us home. All right, I'll, I'll cover these last two questions quickly. The first question is, is it more important to close streets or use the funds for small business support? I'm a small business in the city of Oakland. And the answer is that both are important. And um, I can't speak for funds because I don't control them, but I can, I can say with confidence that the reason that we chose the Oakland Slow Street Program to be implemented the way it is, is because it's very, very inexpensive. We're talking staff time and a few A-frames on a couple of streets and some barricades. We are very proud of how effective we think it might be on a very uh, dime budget, to say the least. Um, but I definitely understand this concern, you know, getting to it, that, that people wanna make sure that government cares about 
the issues and the priorities that they see forth. And, and so I respect what's really underneath this question. Well, and just also to emphasize, a lot of our transportation staff are paid from restricted funds that could not be used for small businesses. We have not pit these things against one another. We care about them both, but also the small street, the slow streets initiative has been done literally on a shoestring. And then how about testing? All right, um, last question everybody. Is the city planning on making more testing centers? Wide scale testing is crucial. We agree wide testing is crucial. Our two sites have a combined capacity of about 500 tests per day. Right now we are nowhere near meeting that capacity need. If we find that we do need more testing sites, the first and foremost is that we can expand Henry J. Kaiser. That's in fact one of the reasons we picked it. We've also coordinated with several other uh, parking lots across the city so that if we need to um, turn on a new site, we can do so pretty much overnight. Um, so please, I, I would want nothing more than to have to meet that challenge, except for the fact that I want people to be safe. So if we need more testing sites, we are definitely able to open them. And we are also very much looking at uh, a next site being established in East Oakland. Again, we are very much uh, cognizant of the racial disparities, access to testing sites for the populations that are most likely to be impacted by those disparities are very important to us as well. So thank you tonight for joining us. Please, uh, as we are in this moment together, let us be proud that we are Oaklanders. Let us practice compassion, kindness, and grace. And let us continue to do our part by staying home, by staying socially distant, by covering our faces with cloth when we leave the house. And please arm yourself with information. The information that was available tonight was amazing and powerful and is not only going to help us get through this crisis, but also emerge much better for it. So thank you everyone. And particularly three of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Eiton, Curtis Sawicki and Warren Logan. Thank you.